Welcome to Chasing the Lost. This podcast contains adult themes and violence and is not intended for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. My name is Melissa Gusset. Um, if you're going to watch this video, please do not have the kids around. Carly Lane Gusset is missing still. She's been missing since. Breathe. She's been missing since 6.30 a.m. The last time that I spoke to her was 5.30. She didn't take her cell phone. We're coming up on 10 hours. And now's the part where I'm saying I have to do something because we've had CHP fly over. We've had Inyo and County, Inyo and Mono County Sher- uh, Sheriff's flying over. Or oh, Bishop PD or CHP flying over. They had their copter day. Thank you to CHP. Love you. And um, we are going to potentially have the helicopter did the search of her very large area. She'll fall all the way around us, all the way down to Lake Laws. And they're amazing. And um, several of them, county sheriffs. And I see all your faces popping up and it makes me want to cry. I love you guys. And I'm putting this out there because um, it's going on 10 hours that she's been missing. And I want to put this on blast because... I don't think she's out in the desert. I think that she could have been abducted or taken because we do have a highway and it happens and I'm being real. And I just want to let everybody know, Alicia, you're calling me. Are you watching the video? She's not watching the video. That's okay. I want to put this on blast because I don't know what to do to consider her a missing person. Um, you can't do an Amber Alert because she didn't leave in a car and I don't have a physical description of a vehicle. She is five foot seven. Hold on. Let's do this good. Wait, there she is. She's five foot seven, about 115 pounds. She has blue eyes and the cutest little nose and a great smile. And her hair goes all the way down past her, like, to her belly, let's say mid-waist, and this was last year's picture, she was, she, she's a little bit different, but not much, she's still, like, adorably cute, she doesn't wear makeup and everything, she left in her jeans, um, and a t-shirt, so, I'm putting it out there, and just go for it, everybody help me out here, I love you all, everybody please watch, share, your friends share, my friends share, everybody so just share the shit out of it. Carly Gousset was 16 years old when she vanished. It was October 13, 2018. The question remains, how? The case is not straightforward, and there are so many unanswered questions surrounding the night before and the morning of her disappearance. Was Carly experiencing paranoia in the days before she vanished? Was she unknowingly drugged? Was she the actual person seen walking towards Highway 6 on the morning of October 13th? Why does her biological mother believe there's more to the story than what is being told? Are her stepmother and dad withholding information? The internet became highly invested in Carly's case as it went on, and there are still some today who are actively posting about it. Let's explore the case of Carly Gousset. Carly lived with her father, Zach, and her stepmother, Melissa. She had been living with them for several years as her biological mother had moved, and they did not want to remove Carly from her school or her friends. According to all three parents, Carly had no mental health issues that they were aware of. She had recently been in trouble at school with marijuana. 
Carly, like many other teens, had begun experimenting. Not long before she went missing, she was suspended from school for smoking and was receiving counseling. She'd quit smoking, her grades were improving. By no means was Carly a kid who was into anything heavy. She wasn't strung out or troubled. But her friends will later report that in the days before October 13th, Carly was having what they referred to as episodes, where she would say that someone was tracking her on her phone. Her behavior was off. None of the three parents recall seeing or hearing anything like this in the time prior to her disappearance. The night before Carly disappeared, her and her boyfriend Donald were supposed to be going to a high school football game, but instead they went to hang out with some friends. Carly did not inform her parents of her change of plans. Between 7 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. that evening, Melissa, her stepmother, called her on the way to pick up food. She let Carly know that she would be getting food and then she'd be headed home. She asked if she would be needing a ride later, and Carly said, no, it's fine, Donald will bring me home. Sometime before 8.15 p.m., Carly had smoked marijuana. According to Donald, it had been a while since Carly smoked. Carly's behavior soon switched from relaxed to paranoid. Now, marijuana can have that effect on some people. But I hadn't read anywhere else that Carly had displayed this behavior after smoking previously. Carly became afraid of the music that was playing and told Donald she didn't feel well and she needed to go home. Donald would later say, quote, Me and Carly were walking almost to my house and she got so damn scared. It was scaring me. So I looked her in the eyes and I said, Carly, baby, you're safe with me. Then she got this horrified look on her face. She started to scream my name. I wrapped my arms around her to hold her, but she bit me in the side. She was pushing me away, so I let go. She told me not to follow her and to go home. So I stayed there in the middle of the street for like 20 minutes. I wanted to chase after my baby, but it was pitch black and I didn't want to scare her anymore. Until this day, I wish I had chased after her. I wish I had made it to the house. I wish none of this had happened." End quote. As Carly ran, she called Melissa to come get her. According to Melissa, Carly was in a panic running down the road. She told Melissa she was scared and she needed to be picked up immediately. She begged Melissa not to hang up the phone. When Melissa arrived at the location that Carly gave her, Carly wasn't there. Melissa started to drive down the road searching, and in the distance she saw a small light. It was Carly's cell phone. She pulled up and Carly jumped in, white as a sheet, and her pupils were completely dilated. She said she was afraid that the car was going to kill her. Melissa estimated it took her about 15 minutes to calm Carly down, and then she brought her home. This account of the events has been told a few times, and unfortunately, the details change a few times. What we believe is Carly did make it back to her home that evening, and there is proof by way of two different video recordings that Melissa took of Carly. Melissa said she took them to show that Carly was behaving crazy the night before. She was hoping that it would teach her that drugs just aren't worth it. Based on the information they've provided, Carly got home and her behavior was erratic. She would be in a corner one moment, terrified and pale, not wanting to be anywhere near her parents. The next, she would be telling them she loved them and she would sit down and try to eat. At one point, Carly was given a salad and spit it out, stating, this is the devil's lettuce. At other points during the night, Carly would want to paint her toenails or read the Bible. She asked in the audio if something were to happen to her, would Melissa call 911? She asked if she would live till the morning. She stated she was afraid of Melissa and Zach, but also wanted Melissa to sleep in bed with her that night. The account of the night has left Lindsay, Carly's mother, wondering why her child wasn't taken to the emergency room. 
Lindsay feared whatever Carly smoked was laced with something. And initially, both Melissa and Zach would say they didn't take her in, and the thought had never entered their minds because it was just marijuana. But they will later say that they absolutely thought she was on something more and did consider taking her to the ER. Melissa states a few things about the next morning. Melissa had an interview with Dateline. I'm going to read that article to you now. The night or the morning of? Well, what you recall, I assume you went to bed. Right. Well, I got home uh, just after work. Um, had had a drink, drink a couple beers. Um, Melissa and Carly showed up. Charlie was acting paranoid, a um, little... Uh, whoa, 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 what do you mean by that? Why was she acting paranoid? Yeah, just went Zachary. Marijuana. Yeah, she had had it. Whoa, 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 I want to go to Zachary. What was she yeah. doing to, to seem paranoid to you? She had admitted to smoking marijuana and... As the reason why Melissa went to pick her up early. What was she doing that was acting paranoid to you? Scared. I know, but what did you observe about her that seemed she was paranoid? She uh, just, she just, uh, was acting very nervous and scared about, you know, uh, her phone, about, about us being around her at moments. And then at other moments, she changed and just, just, uh, you know, say she loves us and asked us if, if, if she was okay. And of course, we said, yeah, you're okay. When you said she was acting nervous and afraid to be around you, what was she doing to make you think that? I don't know. She was, she smoked pot. I don't know what was wrong with her. I know, but you're telling me that she told you or told your wife she had had marijuana. All right, yeah. you're saying she's acting paranoid. What right. was she doing? Was she pacing the floor? Was she biting her fingernails? Was she twitching? Was she crying? Was she anxious? Was she on her phone? Did she call 911? What was she doing to make you tell me that she was acting paranoid? Because I've never seen my children act paranoid. And I don't know what that even looks like for a child. What was she doing? She was uh, just standing in a corner, afraid, afraid of, of not being safe. Did and she that, say that? Yeah, she felt felt like she wasn't safe. Oh, okay, well now, now I'm hearing something. Carly's stepmother, Melissa, told Dateline that in the beginning of October, Carly was a happy kid and her positive attitude was no different than usual. The family had recently moved just north of Bishop to a town called Chalfont, but Carly wasn't phased by the move as she'd been able to stay in the same school district. On Friday, October 12th, Carly left home to hang out with friends as her stepmother says was typical. According to her mother, Lindsay, Carly's boyfriend, Donald, would later say after hanging out with friends for a while, Carly started not to feel well and wanted to leave. She called me to pick her up, Carly's stepmother Melissa told Dateline. I picked her up from town and just brought her home. Melissa told Dateline she and Carly got home around 9 p.m. and according to Melissa, they ate dinner and then went to bed. Carly's father, Zach, told Dateline Carly seemed disoriented before she went to bed but would not comment further on her condition. The next morning around 5.45 a.m., Melissa said she went through her usual routine of opening the kids' doors and saying good morning to them. She told Dateline she saw Carly in her bed at that time. Melissa said she went back to bed for a little bit, and when she woke up a little bit later, 
She opened Carly's door again. Carly was nowhere to be found. I went back to our bedroom and I said to Zach, Honey, she's not here. And he said, What do you mean she's not here? Melissa said, I told him, She's gone. She's not in her room. She's not outside. She's not in the backyard. She's not anywhere. Melissa and Zachary told Dateline they first thought Carly might have gone for a walk. They decided to each get in their cars and drive around town to see if they could find her. Carly's father, Zach, told Dateline he wasn't nervous at first because he thought they'd find her walking down the road. But after two hours and five minutes of searching with no sign of Carly, Zach said his concern grew quickly. Melissa says it was about 9.30 a.m. when they arrived home after their search. Zachary then called Carly's mother, Lindsay, who lives in Nevada, to let her know Carly was missing. He then called the Mono County Sheriff's Office and filed a missing persons report. Melissa and Zach say the deputies came to the house a few hours later and began asking neighbors if they'd seen anything unusual. Meanwhile, Lindsay drove in from her home in Nevada. In March of 2019, in an interview on the Dr. Phil daytime talk show, Melissa told Dr. Phil she had lied to NBC in October when she spoke to Dateline. Quote from Dr. Phil, Melissa, you told NBC the next morning that at 5.45 a.m. you did your usual routine of opening the kids' doors, saying good morning, getting them ready for school, that sort of thing. Did you, she was still in bed at that time? Did you go back and lay down? End quote. Melissa responds with, no, the Dateline NBC, yeah, that was a false story because it wasn't, well, it was a lie about checking on Carly because it was the beginning and I didn't know what to say and I shouldn't have even done the interview. Carly's father, Zach, was also on the set with Dr. Phil. He tells Dr. Phil, it was just too early. You don't know what to do. There's no handbook for this man. So it now becomes unclear on when the last time Carly was seen. The contradicting statements naturally left people with questions about what really happened that morning. While understanding that it was early in the investigation, the parents may not have wanted to give out too much information that may embarrass Carly. She may have come home or have been located. That could be the reason. But just two weeks later, in an interview with the Las Vegas Review Journal, Melissa told them she woke up at 5.45 a.m., and looked over at Carly, who was still wide awake. And then she turned over and went back to sleep. The statement clearly matches with the account of the night prior, where Carly asked her to sleep in her bed with her. This discrepancy doesn't really help in the overall case for finding Carly, but it did help to start a lot of rumors online that we'll address later. In both versions, Melissa and Zach leave in separate cars to go search for Carly. We don't have an exact time they left, but in one statement, Melissa says that she woke up, immediately panicked that Carly wasn't there, and they jumped in their cars to go search. They also stated they searched for two hours and then called Lindsay. Lindsay said her call came in at 9.30. Based on that information, we can safely say that they left in the cars by 7.30 a.m. There were witnesses. The first witness, a 78-year-old retired police officer stated, Lindsay walked up to him and asked if he'd seen her daughter, and he said he believed he had. That she had walked by between 6.30 and 6.45 a.m. He said he was in his hot tub room looking out the window and saw a tall, slender female walk by with a piece of paper in her hand. When she was uh, missing, and I don't quite understand the whole thing, I was in my hot tub room, uh, it was probably about 6.30, 7 o'clock, I'm kind of, this happened a couple years ago, so I'm just trying to guess at it, but I'd say between 6.30 and 7, and uh, it was kind of chilly that morning, I remember, and for some reason I looked out towards the street, I have big, big windows in the hot tub room, so I looked out towards the street, and I thought, that's not unusual, there's a young girl walking by. She had long, kind of long brown hair, 
Uh, she, she had clothes on. She had a white, I think, I can't even remember, but I think she had a white top and maybe gray bottoms or something. But she had clothes on, but it was kind of chilly. And I thought, that's kind of kind of weird that she would be there. And she was waving a, a piece of paper, like a, a 12 by 12 piece of paper. She was just waving it in the air and, and walked by. Now, later that morning, I think it was about... Eight o'clock, maybe I'm guessing, probably, that her mother says, "Have you seen my daughter?" And I told her the story that I had just seen a girl walk by, but I didn't know it was her. Oh, that was her. I think you were the last one to see her. I said, "Well, I don't know. Well, I'll help you go look." So at that time, I had a, a, a side-by-side motorcycle. So I rode up into the canyon, which is straight over from my house, because I figured maybe that's where she would go because I have two chairs set up in that little canyon and there's a little fire pit there and I shoot my guns down into the canyon and I went over there and she wasn't there and by the time I came back she was at my driveway and I told her I didn't see anything and she says well well, thank you very much and that's about the last I really heard of the whole thing. Two other witnesses came forward and said they also saw Carly that morning. One witness, Kenneth Dutton, who lived down the road, said he saw her walking by holding a sheet of paper. He said it was between 6.45 and 7 a.m. She was wearing a white t-shirt and gray sweats. The final witness was a wooder who said he saw her between 7.15 and 7.30 standing behind a wire fence at the corner of Highway 6. Based on the witness statements, Zach and Melissa missed Carly by seconds. From their home to the corner of Highway 6 is less than a mile. It's approximately a 17-minute walk or a two-minute car ride. Melissa took the same walk the next morning. She said it took 24 minutes and 42 seconds. In a video on October 18th, Melissa says, I just missed her. It's Sunday, October 14th, and it's officially 24 hours. So this is the way that she walked. Her house is right there. And she walked away from the house and walked down the street that way. I want everybody to be able to see from my perspective. Search and rescue is at laws. I know Brian, Jamas, and Yoba went down there and they kicked him out. I told them to go back. My husband's heading down there. I don't know what to do. But keep reposting and sharing. To help her come home. A search ensued, including the FBI, police, drones, dogs, but there was no sign of Carly anywhere. Law enforcement said that every resident in that area had been spoken to personally by a member of law enforcement, and no one had saw Carly that day other than the three people who had come forward. Melissa immediately took to Facebook and began asking for assistance. There was a Facebook page and group opened. Melissa made many videos and posts within the group. Some were extremely emotional. On October 16th, Melissa posted a man possibly saw Carly about four hours away in another town asking for money. The girl had a pierced nose. The original info posted about Carly neglected to include that information. Carly did have her nose pierced, but it was on the other side. The Facebook group did help to push Carly's flyer out there to get in touch with media and to get her face on the national and local news. Unfortunately, as we often see in these types of cases, social media can be very harmful. It can be wonderful and helpful as well. 
but soon two teams were pitted against each other. The ones who wanted to help Melissa and Zach, and then those who were on the biological mother Lindsay's side. It almost became a war of social media before anyone knew what was happening. People began to put out tips, and some were false, of course. They were trying, for the most part, the good people. They would hit the streets, they would hang up flyers, they would contact the local media, and push for Carly's story to get out there. However, there were those who were going back and forth from group to group to claim allegations that one group was making about the other, and this was not helpful at all. There were people who joined the groups simply to accuse Melissa and Zach of doing something terrible to Carly. Then there were the people who were accusing Lindsay of not being involved in her daughter's life. None of this helped in the search for Carly. Trouble. I'm begging baby girl. Please come home. Other posts from Lindsay say, This is absolutely insane. This is my daughter. There has been zero information given other than timelines changing. No one physically saw my daughter leave her home. Her personal residence wasn't even cleared until nine hours after she went missing. I'm very disappointed in the efforts in locating Carly. I feel I could have done a better investigation on my own. Something is not sitting right with me on this. Mother's intuition. Please keep Carly in your prayers. We are the ones lost without her. I love you, Carly, and you aren't... Lindsay goes on to say, Nine hours after she went missing, plenty of room for tampering with her cell phone, and trust me, that was done. I saw it with my own eyes. I am Carly's biological mother, and I have questions. Like why there was an eight-minute audio made of my daughter's behavior, but they couldn't take the eight minutes to call 911 to get my daughter help if they were concerned with her behavior. The stories keep changing. I just want her home. Now that we have most of the basics out of the way, we're going to discuss why there was such controversy overall. What were the discrepancies? Let's first talk about the video audio that Melissa made. On Dr. Phil, he was eventually able to hear a couple of minutes of one of the audios. Allegedly, there are two, one that's over 20 minutes long and one that's just over eight minutes long. Dr. Phil asked why they had not brought the audios or allowed his producers to hear them. And they kind of tried to blow that off. They said that they weren't asked any of that. And Dr. Phil said they absolutely were. He also went on to, he was somewhat offended. And he said that they wouldn't give them the witnesses information. They wouldn't even give their own address. And Melissa, again, denies being asked any of this. And then she says, well, I don't really want to bring people into it who aren't involved so that people aren't harassed. And Dr. Phil is offended and asks if she's ever seen him disclose disclose people's locations, that he's been doing this for many years. Finally, they give in and they let him hear some of the audio. Now, my understanding, based on internet rumors, is he was only allowed to hear two to three minutes of the audio. If that is not true, then perhaps he did hear the whole eight minutes. In either case, here is what he said. Now, I've just listened to a tape that Melissa made of Carly the night that she came home. Um, I'm, for one, am very glad that you made that recording uh, because it's full of information and data. What it tells me is... um, as I said, it, this was a mind-altering drug. Somebody had laced that marijuana, or that wasn't just a meth head talking. There was more to it than that. Um, and it would be interesting to know where that came from. And it, because of her degree of paranoia, it makes perfect sense to me um, that she would flee. 
that she would wake up and flee. And if she flees and gets to a highway and gets picked up, um, as much as you hate to think about it or say it, um, there aren't a bunch of Boy Scouts necessarily on that highway, uh, which is good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is she might well have been picked up and the good news is they're not usually picked up to be killed. Outside of Dr. Phil, Fox News was able to also listen to one of the two recordings, the one that was eight minutes and 45 seconds long. In the article it says, Carly's shaking voice conveyed deep angst, saying she didn't want to sleep in case she was killed and asking Melissa to call 911 if needed. The teary teen apologized and allegedly continued in something of a panic mode, littered with I love yous and hi, talking to her stepmom, who appeared to have been calmly talking her down until well after 3 a.m. Carly's mother, Lindsay, talks about the audio. The confusion state, it wasn't, I mean, they say disoriented. You know, she was acting disoriented and paranoid well from my my you know hearing the audio she was definitely confused definitely concerned if she was going to be okay um but not i don't know she said she was scared in the audio she said she said mom in the audio and melissa goes i'm melissa silly and she goes oh i'm sorry i'm just really scared and that's, of course, you know, what breaks my heart because she was calling for me and uh, I wasn't there. I wasn't there to help her. I don't know what she's scared of. And uh, it's just hard for me to hear that. And that's been one of the hardest parts is because that's the moment I hear her call for me. Melissa said she slept in Carly's bed because she was concerned about her. And do you know if they had a close relationship or that would be a normal thing? No, it's not normal at all. Um, you know, like, after listening and reviewing their um, interview, um, it's definitely, the, the stories are so all over the place. Um, they said that they like got up like three or four times from her bed and was like back and forth in the living room watching movies and um okay let's go to bed and okay let's go watch a movie and it just and perhaps that is her behavior that night but um the the thing that really uh stood out to me was the fact that she claims the FBI, you know, wiped her phone clean, but yet she still had the eight minute, 43 second audio of my daughter. So why would they take the 23 minute audio or video and not the eight minute, 43 second one? It didn't make sense. So I call BS on that. <laughs> The next issue that seemed to draw a lot of attention was the last thing that Carly was wearing. The last time Melissa saw Carly in bed, she was wearing a t-shirt and underwear. The Mono County Sheriff's Office initially reported they had no description of what Carly was wearing. By 5 p.m. the same day, they posted again, stating Carly may have been wearing a white shirt and gray sweats. My assumption was Melissa got this information from the former officer who said that he saw Carly that morning. But as I went back to research, it was witnesses two and three who gave the descriptions of the white shirts and the gray sweats. But in order for the sheriff to update the clothing at 5 p.m. that day, someone provided that information. At 4.36 p.m., Melissa said in a video posted to Facebook, Carly was wearing her skinny jeans not sweats. This was after the neighbor had spoken to Melissa. So at this point, had that neighbor given any clothing description at all? Melissa said she assumed what Carly had on was whatever she had on the night before. 
Donald knew what she had on, and he says she was wearing his dark blue Vans t-shirt with yellow writing, light blue skinny jeans, and a black Adidas hoodie. Also on October 13th, the Inyo County Sheriff's Office posted Carly was wearing either a blue t-shirt with yellow writing or a cream and white shirt with blue jeans and Vans. On October 14th, Melissa posted a video and in it she states, I just had a neighbor call me and inform me he did see her yesterday morning walking down the road towards Highway 6. She was wearing a white t-shirt and sweatpants, gray or dark gray. He saw her between at 7, 7.30, 7.15, 7.30 in the morning. My name is Melissa Gusey. My daughter Carly Gusey is still missing. It's been 28 hours. Um, this is an update. This is in Bishop, California. Um, I just had a neighbor call me and inform me that he saw her yesterday morning walking down the road towards Highway 6. And she was wearing a white t-shirt and sweatpants, dark gray, gray, dark gray. And he saw her around 7.30, 7, 7 30 in the morning. So, maybe we need to push it a little bit harder. I don't know what kind of links we have and what it may or may not be, but that's a highway and there's thousands of people that drive down that road every day. And maybe she's just across the street. She's just in the desert. She's dehydrated. But thank you all. I love you. Let's bring her home, all right? So this left me confused. We know the first witness said he saw her between 6.30 and 6.45. The second witness, who we believe is the one she's referring to here, initially said he saw her between 6.45 and 7 a.m. This account is now between 7 and 7.30. And also, this witness was told to Melissa by law enforcement, not on the phone, according to a post that she made. Her post says, The guy in the jacuzzi is a retired police officer and was specific on his description and that she had a piece of paper in her hand that, which she was writing on that morning and it's no longer in her room and she kept looking up at the stars. The second witness said he saw her walking at 6.45 to 7 and she kept looking back at him. The water guy said 7.15 to 7.30. These last two witnesses were told to us by law enforcement. So if the last two witnesses were told to them by law enforcement, who is the person who called her on the 14th stating a neighbor just called to inform her that he did see her sometime at 7, 7.30, 7.15, 7.30? I don't know. Two witnesses did confirm to the Las Vegas Review Journal that on the morning of October 13th, Carly walked by herself towards the highway holding a piece of paper. The neighbor, Kenneth Dutton, who I believe is witness number two, says, I know her, I saw her. On Dr. Phil, Melissa had stated, the first witness says he saw her at 6.30 walking down our street, the former law enforcement officer. Dr. Phil asked if he saw her with a piece of paper and Melissa replied, yes. So did Mr. Eddie ever say what Carly was wearing? Because it was the other two who thought that she was in the white shirt. And if Mr. Eddie never saw the white shirt, and the second two witnesses didn't come forward until the following day, how did the sheriff update the description on the 13th? That remains unknown at this point. By day nine, Melissa comes back on Facebook to tell the group members the story of what happened. 
She alludes that she hasn't really been able to do that because it's an active investigation, so she couldn't give much information. But she states the police have hit a dead end and there are no clues. So she goes on to tell what happened that night and the next morning. Um, today is day nine of Carly being missing. I'm on here to share more info. I just spoke to the sergeant and they are at a dead end. And now I can release more information about the events. Just lots of questions that I haven't been allowed to talk about because of the investigation. And so I'm here to tell you guys all about it. Um, Friday night, I picked up Carly from town. She was supposed to be at a football game. She had lied to me and told me that she was at the football game. And when she called me, she said she was sorry. I was with friends. I'm sorry. Can you please just come get me? So I drove to town and picked her up. She was by herself. And yeah, when she got in the car, I said, what's going on? Where have you been? I've been with friends. I got high. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please don't be mad at me. I'm sorry. And I'm like, smoke marijuana? Like, okay. She was very paranoid. She was scared. And she hadn't smoked weed in a month. And being a mother, I wasn't going to take her to the hospital. She's high on marijuana. Why would I? I just, it didn't cross my mind. She was fine. We talked the whole way home. I brought her home. We spent the night. When we got home, she was still paranoid. Almost like extremely stoned. And, um... We got home, and then I had her eat. She had a salad. She, I made her eat a power bar, and she was just very paranoid, and she wanted me to spend the night with her. So um, <clears throat> her brothers were awake, and Zach was awake, and we hung out, and she ate, and then she was like, can we go to bed? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, well, can you come sleep with me? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not, whatever. I'll lay with you and watch a movie. And um, so um, we hung out for a little bit in the kitchen, talked a bunch, and then her brothers went to bed. And so then I went to bed with her, and then we got up. I had to go to the bathroom, brush my teeth, wash my face. She was by my side the whole time. She didn't want to leave my side. She, Yes, she was paranoid. And, um, still just not thinking, well, maybe she did smoke something that was bad. Maybe somebody gave her something. I don't know. And so we ended up back in the living room with her brothers for a little bit, watched a movie, and she was just still kind of paranoid. And then we went back to bed, and I spent the whole night with her. I mean, I was awake, and then I doze off, and she's just there. She was just hanging out. She was awake. She wanted to paint my toenails. She wanted to color. She wanted to do a whole lot of stuff. And so I was, I was up, and then I would doze off, and I was up, and I would doze off, and she was there the whole time. And... I was really scared to put this out there because so many people are judgmental and I don't want her story to die. And I was so scared just to say anything. And the investigators are like, you can't talk to anybody about this because the FBI was involved. And if anybody finds out or they get spooked or somebody tips somebody off, then she could be right here and then she could be gone. So this is hard right now because I'm just, I don't want people to judge her could smoke pot all the time and so around 5 40 48 was my last text in the morning um and uh I fell back asleep and then that's when I woke up and she was gone and I wish I wanted to fall asleep but 
guys how to know the details and I was allowed to share them so I wanted to put them out there because obviously the trolls are roaming and um, I'm not a liar and I don't have anything to hide and I'm it's okay to tell you guys you guys all want her home who cares what she did and she's not dis disoriented anymore if she is and I said that in the beginning not even because the way she was acting but because if she's been out in the desert for three hours, yeah, she's going to be disoriented. She didn't take anything with her. The people that saw her said she only had white t-shirt and gray pants, and that was it. She didn't have a water bottle. I don't, I don't know what she's got, and if she's out in the desert, it's hot here. And those of us that live here, you're dehydrated, you're thirsty, you're hungry. What if she fell and hit her head? And that, so I woke up. It was like 7.18, and... I said, because I was in her bed, and her door was open all night, so I, I couldn't have heard that, and um, I was in her bed, and she was just gone, and I immediately got up, and I looked around the house, and I'm just going, where is she, did she, where, I just don't know, where the hell is she, and I go in and tell Zach, and I say, Carly's not in her bed, and so just started to panic and got in our cars and just started driving all around. I drove my Corolla out in the boonies over boulders and Zach took the truck and he took the binoculars. And then, you know, two hour point, two hours was the point where something's wrong. And then for the neighbor to say he saw her at 630 in the morning is what he told me, but he's older. And then the three confirmed people, two are neighbors that live up here, and the one other person that saw her was a wooder driving by and just saw her standing inside the barbed wire fence. So, and the timeline that they say, and I was like, how could I have missed her? You know, she was just right there. Just something's wrong. Somebody took her. There's just something. And I wanted to put it out there, and I want you guys all to know. And so, if you needed to know all that, great. And if you didn't care, great, because I don't care. I just want her. We want her home. And thank you for the continued support. And uh, let's bring Carly home, and thank you all again. As you've heard for most of the time, there was a lot of confusion on what she was wearing. That seems to be because it was first assumed she just threw on whatever she had on the night before, and then the witnesses came into play. Nancy Grace does a good job trying to pin down what exactly she was wearing. Now this is days later. There's time by this point to go through the laundry to check and see if anything's up on top of the laundry. I don't think it's far-fetched to think she just grabbed something accessible rather than went through her closet, went through her drawers, look for something that may have been hanging up. If Melissa was in the bed with her that night and so much was going on that night and the next morning, I don't think Carly could have gotten around the room looking for clothing within dresser drawers or closets without Melissa hearing something. So my guess is she just picked up the closest pair of pants and either she was in the t-shirt she was sleeping in or she grabbed a t-shirt off the top of her laundry basket. In any case, Nancy Grace does try to pin down best she can what Carly may have been wearing. Thank you. Melissa, my first question is this. Um, I understand that you last saw Carly in bed with you at around 5.30 a.m. Is that right? Around 5.45, yes. Okay. I've gotten 5.30 and I've gotten 6.30, but now you're clarifying it's 5.45. Now, in your Facebook Live, you said that she was wearing jeans, I think. Yeah. I only said that because she always wears her skinny jeans, so I just assumed that she had her skinny jeans on. Would she have worn blue jeans to bed? I had I had picked her up and she had her skinny jeans on. 
I know, but I mean, when you were in bed with her at 5.45 a.m., did she still have on her jeans? No. Okay, so... She had a t-shirt and just her underwear. Okay, let me understand, because in the Facebook Live, I'm trying to get the description of what she had on the last time you saw her out there. So in the Facebook... The last time I saw her in our home... She only had a t-shirt and her undergarment. Okay. Then that Facebook lie that she blasted out saying look for her in the skinny jeans. What what are we supposed to do with that? That Yeah. That's not right. I well, yeah, I was in a panic and she's not one of to go out of the house in foot pants or <laughs> okay. All right. So the last time you saw her, she was not wearing what was on the Facebook Live. She was wearing a T-shirt and undies. All right. Question: Were her PJs the T-shirt? Was the T-shirt found in the home after she disappeared? No. Okay. What was on the T-shirt? What was it? From what I can remember, it was like a band t-shirt or some kind of t-shirt that had a logo on the back and then the small one over like where your heart is. Gotcha. Was it white, blue? What was it? It was like a white creamish color. Okay. Do you know what the t-shirt said? No. Okay. Uh, do you know the colors of the t-shirt? It was like a white creamish, and then the the logo was also very light. Okay, got it. And that T-shirt that she was in bed with, wearing at 545, is not in the home. That tells me she's still in the T-shirt. Yeah, she, I could not find that in her laundry or anywhere. Okay, got it. Now, what about her skinny jeans? Are they missing? You know, I wouldn't even be able to say yes or no because she has so many clothes. She has like 20 pairs of skinny jeans and 50 different shirts. She has a lot of clothes. Okay. Regarding the skinny jeans, were they black or blue? The ones that she had worn the night before were light blue. Light blue. Are those missing, the ones she wore the night before? Are they in the dirty clothes? Where are they? I'm trying to figure out what was she wearing when she disappeared. I don't know. Because the two confirmed neighbors said that she had the white shirt and gray sweatpants. Okay, are the gray sweatpants missing? I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, the... She has so many clothes, I can't even... Vans, a, a dark pair of sweatpants, and a white t-shirt, that's what we know. And that was confirmed by right, three, three different people. Two neighbors, and then... Okay, one. now I'm, I'm just hearing that for the first time. Tell me about that. What did the three neighbors say? Um, okay, so when we first went out searching in the morning... We searched for two hours, and one neighbor that lives on our street, he's older, and I asked him, I said, did you see my daughter walking down the street, you know, a young girl? And he said, yeah, actually, I did. And I said, do you know what time? And he said, it was about 6.30. And I was like, okay. And then <laughs> as this, just the searching and everything keeps going on, we have had three more people to our neighbors who live right in this community that saw her wearing a white t-shirt, gray sweatpants, and tennis shoes, walking west on our, high, on our road. And then the other one confirmed person was a wooder, which is like somebody who goes out to chop wood. He saw her at 7.30, down by Highway 6. Where in the world do you think she was headed. As you just heard, now there seem to be four witnesses. In all of the research I've done, I've only come up with the three. Mr. Eddie, the gentleman who lives down the street, Kenneth, 
and the wooder. But now apparently there's Mr. Eddie, Kenneth, a mystery neighbor, as well as a wooder. So I'm just left really confused now. I have not seen that in any place. And perhaps some of you listening may have seen that information somewhere. And if so, if you could direct me to the news source, that would be great. Let's talk about Carly's phone. Keep in mind, Carly's 16 years old. It has been stated that everything prior to the phone call to Melissa was removed off Carly's phone. Carly was known to be very organized, but enough to delete every single message and call off of her phone? In the state of mind that she was in, I would think that that would be pretty difficult to do. Perhaps she hadn't sent or received any messages that day or night? And I'd really like to know if she makes it a habit to delete all messages, you know, as soon as they come in. Does she do it at a certain time? I just found it extremely odd for a 16 year old, even if it was a habit that she kept, mainly due to her state of mind. Now, Donald says that at 10 15 p.m., Carly's phone messaged him. The weed was laced. But in the morning, when Donald came over to the Goose home, he said he saw Carly's phone in her bedroom. Melissa insisted that it wasn't. Both Melissa and Donald insisted. Carly left her phone sitting on the kitchen counter all night long and never touched it. Melissa said Carly was writing on a piece of paper. Who texted Donald that the weed was laced at 10.15 p.m.? We know that the second video that Melissa took of Carly ended at 10.30 p.m., 15 minutes prior to the text to Donald. We also know Melissa did text Donald herself from her phone at 1.27 a.m. saying, please pray. Then she texted him at 12.12 12 a.m. with just one word, Donald. Another text at 5.16 a.m. came in from Donald to Melissa, asking if Carly was okay. And she replied, no, not really. And he said to her, watch her, please. Now is the really strange part. There was a message at 8.28 a.m. from Melissa to Donald. Melissa writes, I think it was more than weed. She's acting like she's on meth. Melissa makes it sound as if Carly is with her at 8.28 a.m. And Donald responds, is she with you? I don't have any further information on any other text messages, but I really found that last one strange. At 8.28 a.m., they would be out searching. Did she stop to message Donald? And if so, why? The last time any witness saw Carly was at the very latest, 7.30 a.m. Melissa and Zach said that they were out searching until at least 9.30 a.m. So it would surprise me if she pulled off the road and texted Donald, I think it was more than weed. She's acting like she's on meth. That is just a very strange message and the time does not fit in at all with the timeline. Let me ask you this, her cell phone. The boyfriend that came over said the cell phone, her cell phone, which I'm surprised she left it behind, but that the cell phone was by the bed. When the cops got there, the cell phone was on the island or in the kitchen. Is that part right? No, the cell phone was in the kitchen the whole time. Okay, got it. 
Let me think. Do you know the code to get into her cell phone? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Did you go into it to find out who she last texted? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Who was she last speaking to and what time? I don't remember the time, but um, I was the last person that had called her. I don't know. Yeah, it was. 8.30, the night before, because we got home at uh, 9, like 8, 8.30. So she was in the home at 9 p.m. Friday night? Correct. Okay. Ultimately, no one has ever come forward with a credible lead on Carly. She's never contacted any of her parents or friends and we're left with more questions than answers. Did she walk to Highway 6 and get picked up by someone who meant her harm? It's possible. I don't think smoking marijuana 12 hours earlier would make a smart teenager get up in the morning and leave their home, not dressed for the elements, and walk towards a highway with no money, no extra clothing, and no cell phone. We don't know if that person was Carly. They hadn't lived in the area very long, and Melissa was wearing a similar outfit. The sun had not risen when the person who may have recognized her, Mr. Eddie, saw the female walking. We don't know if she was drugged. Donald insists that she wasn't. He and others smoked the same marijuana that Carly did that night, and nobody else had a reaction like Carly did. Now, we do know that she was having these episodes days before she went missing, or at least we think we know that based on one of her friend's statements. Was that true? And if so, why didn't any of her parents notice that? It is a possibility that she had some type of psychotic break. But again, without confirmation from her parents of behaviors prior to the night in question, we have to chalk it up to some kind of drug being slipped into the marijuana that she smoked, but not into the marijuana that everybody else smoked. We don't know if something happened within Carly's home that night after the second video was taken. It is a possibility, but at this point, it's been over three years and there's been no clues and no sign of Carly. If you haven't heard of Carly's case, I will place her flyer on my YouTube community wall. If you'd be so kind, please share it. I will leave a link below and share it to your social media and make others aware of her case. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next time.